Hello everybody, this is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Today I'm continuing with the study of the book of Galatians, a verse-by-verse -verse commentary. And today I'll pick up where I left off last time, chapter 3, verse 15. Brethren, I speak after the manner of men, though it be but a man's covenant, yet it be confirmed. No man disannulleth or addeth thereto. Okay, uh, this is one of those times where I can immediately say uh, uh, the Amplified may be of great help to me on this verse. So let's see how the Amplified, Amplified phrases that. Brothers and sisters, I speak in terms of human relations. Even though a last will and testament is just a human covenant, yet when it has been signed and made legally binding, no one sets it aside or adds to it, modifying it in some way. Okay, uh, so now that's that makes perfect sense to me now. Um, and verse 16 in the KJV, Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not, and to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. Uh, the Amplified phrases it. Now the promises in the covenants were decreed to Abraham and to his seed. God does not say, and to seeds, that is, your descendants, your heirs. Uh, as if referring to many persons, but as to one, and to your seed, which is none other than Christ. Okay, so and that is a very, very important fact that some people could come to some horrible, uh, erroneous conclusions if they don't understand that this uh, promise is uh, referring to Abraham's seed, not his descendants, but his seed being uh, through his genealogy, an individual will be born, one person who is the promised Messiah Savior. And we know that has happened, and that is Jesus Christ. Uh, verse 17 in the KJV, And this I say, that the covenant that was confirmed before, before of God in Christ, the law, which was 430 years after, cannot disannul that it should make the promise of none effect. So uh, Paul is saying that uh, uh, the law that was uh, given to Moses came 430 years later after the promise that was given to Abraham. So the law didn't disannul and just nullify the promise. The promise is uh, still in effect, or it was still in effect at the time that uh, the the law was given. The law didn't didn't change that. Uh, uh, let me read that seventeen in the Amplified. This is what I mean: the law, which came into existence. 430 years later, after the covenant concerning the coming Messiah, does not and cannot invalidate the covenant previously established by God so as to abolish the promise. So the, the, the promise given to Abraham remained in effect even though the new laws were laid down. Verse 18 in the, in the KJV, for if the inheritance be of the law, it is of no more of promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. So don't think that now that the, the, the law has been laid down, that all of a sudden that the, uh, uh, the inheritance will come by your ability to follow the law. No, uh, nothing has changed. Uh, the inheritance uh, the, the, the promised land, the, the, the seed, the, the future Savior, Messiah, uh, all of that is still in effect, 
And it's because of the promise. It's not because of the law. Verse 18 in the Amplified, for if the inheritance of what was promised is based on observing the law, as these false teachers claim, it is no longer based on a promise. However, God granted it to Abraham as a gift by virtue of his promise. I like the way the Amplified has amplified the verse to expound so that we understand that uh, it says, as these false teachers claim, because that gets us right back into the whole context and uh, makes us should make us aware of the technique that Paul uses here and uses throughout his letters, and that is that he's presenting the false teacher's point of view and then the correct point of view. Uh, um, in my series on uh, was Paul a diatribalist, uh, pro sopapia, I hope you'll watch that. That series isn't very long, maybe 30 minutes or so. Uh, but I, I think that um, the conclusion I, I came to at least is that Paul did use the technique of prosopopoeia uh, when he wrote his letters. Some of the things he writes uh, are actually contradictory to Paul's uh, own viewpoint. Um, for, for example, uh, at one point in Romans, he, he, he says that, uh, that uh, you're justified by your works. And in the context is salvation. So we're not talking about any other kind of justification. We're talking about a man's salvation is justified by his works. And it's completely contradictory to what Paul taught. So my challenge to everybody is, uh, how do you make that make sense? How do you, is, is Paul like schizophrenic? Uh, is he teaching us one thing and then right, the next thing out of his mouth is the exact opposite? Now, what he's doing is, uh, in, in Romans, he's presenting the false teacher's point of view, and then he's going to uh, rebut it and, and uh, refute it. And uh, so here, the, in the Amplified, it says that as these false teachers claim, so let me see, that's verse 18 in the KJV. For if the inheritance be of the law, as the false teachers claim, is is uh, what we need to understand. So he's not saying it's possible that uh, the inheritance could come by the law. You, you know that's a possibility. Paul is not saying that. He's saying if the inheritance be the law, as the false teachers are saying. So you really need to understand that in much of Paul's writings, he is uh, arguing against the false teachers, uh, the Judaizers. Uh, the men from Judea, the, the men from uh, Jerusalem, uh, the men from James, uh, all those people who are teaching that practicing Judaism is an essential for salvation. Uh, he, much of what Paul is writing, he's, he's telling you, this is what they say, but they're wrong, and this is the truth. So keep that in mind, that that is Paul's technique. As you read all of Paul's letters, keep that in mind always. Verse 19 in the uh, KJV, Wherefore then serveth the law? It was added because of transgressions, till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. And it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. Okay, uh, I don't know what that's referring to, but maybe the Amplified can help me with that. Let me see. Uh, 19 in the Amplified says, Why then the law? Uh, what was its purpose? Well, it was added after the promise to Abraham to reveal to the, to the people their guilt because of transgressions, that is, to make people conscious of the sinfulness of sin. And the law was ordained through angels and delivered to Israel by the hand of a mediator, Moses, the mediator between God and Israel, to be in effect until the seed would come to whom the promise had been made. Until the seed would come, that's Jesus, would come to, to whom the promise had been made, which was Abraham's uh, descendants, and in fact, the whole world, because the promise was that the whole world would be blessed 
because of this promise uh, and this this seed that would come in the future. Um, uh, the only thing I'm missing, maybe someone could help me out. Let me see if there's a footnote uh, about it. No, but it's the reference, the use of the word angels. Um, when it says, the law was ordained through angels and delivered to Israel by the hand of a mediator. So if anybody watching can tell me this reference to ordained through angels, uh, maybe it's obvious that I'm just not, I'm, I'm missing it somehow. But what does this mean? Ordained through angels and delivered to Israel by the hand of a mediator. Now, that's obvious. The hand of the mediator, of course, is Moses. Uh, God used Moses to deliver the law. Um, 20 in KJV. Now, a mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. And in the Amplified, it says, Now, the mediator or go-between in a transaction is not needed for just one party. Okay, that makes perfect sense now. Why do you need a mediator? If I'm here by myself and there's no other person involved in a, in a dispute with me, there's no need for a mediator. Only if there's another person and then there's a disagreement between the two of us could a mediator be of any help. So... Uh, it says, uh, now the mediator or the, the go-between in a transaction is not needed for just one party, whereas God is only one and was the only one giving the promise to Abraham. But the law was a contract between two, God and Israel. Its validity depended on both. Mm -hmm. Okay. The validity depended on both. Well, God is the, is the lawgiver. He has the authority to give the law. And we know that he gave the law to prove to them their sinfulness and need for a savior. Uh, and then the, it depended on both, which means the people who received the law, it's up to them to uh, try to follow that law and fall flat on their face and realize this is impossible. Uh, I need a savior. There is one Savior, uh, the only Savior, our great God and Savior, Jesus. Uh, so, verse 21 in the, in the KJV, Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid! For if there had been a law given, which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. Um, so is, is the law then against the promises of God? Uh, so some people would think that, uh, well, Abraham received the promise. Why is there a need for the, the law? Uh, is there some kind of a conflict or contradiction going on here? Why have you got a promise? Why do you need the law too? Well, we know that the law was given, uh, to, uh, uh, shut everyone's mouth uh, so that they can't boast, so that they can't say, I've been perfect from my first breath to my last breath, uh, so I deserve heaven. Uh, no, everybody, in the, even their own judging of themselves, would have to conclude that um, even though I'm better than most people, uh, I have to admit, you know, I have not been perfect. So, but scriptures say that uh, that uh, if you if you err in one point of the law, then you're completely guilty. So you have to, if you want to be judged by the law, then you're under a curse. And it said earlier in the in the teaching here that uh, uh, if you choose to try to earn your righteousness by following the law, then uh, you're you're actually under a curse because it's actually impossible to do it. So when you decide to do that, you're Really putting a curse on yourself. You're 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 condemning yourself. You're you're condemned to the second death of the lake of fire because you're choosing to to try to do something that's actually impossible. Let's read 22 in the Amplified. Uh, but the Scripture has imprisoned everyone, everything, the entire world under sin, 
so that the inheritance, the, the blessing of salvation, which was promised through faith in Jesus Christ, might be given to those who believe in him and acknowledge him as God's precious son. Hmm. I should have read, I meant to have read that first in the KJV. The KJV says, but the scripture hath concluded all under sin. So every person who's ever lived is under sin, uh, except for one. And Jesus is not under sin in, uh, in, innately uh, because, because he, he was not born as a sinner, as the rest of us are. We are all born with a genetic defect, uh, a, a disease that's passed on from generation to generation. And the disease is we are sinners by nature. So therefore, uh, uh, we're going to sin and uh, it's only a matter of time and it's only a matter of degrees and a matter of, you know, our own preferences for what kind of sinning we want to do. Uh, but it's inevitable, except for one person. Jesus was not born uh, with the sin nature. Uh, so everyone, uh, there, everyone is under sin. So the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. So by faith of Jesus Christ, well, is as I discussed earlier, does that mean that be, by the faithfulness of Christ, because he faithfully, willingly went to the cross, uh, or is it by uh, the faith in Jesus Christ, our faith in him, in, uh, in uh, his, his ability alone to save us, uh, his uh, work, not our own, and his work was paying for our sins, so our sins are, are uh, washed away. Uh, and his uh, living a perfect, sinless life and all the good works that he did are credited to us. When we put our faith in him, we are given this robe of righteousness. It's the, uh, the, um, uh, the, the wedding garment. So that when God looks and says, oh, I see some of you have the wedding garment on, the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Uh, I choose you, all who have this wedding garment, come in. And you who do not have the garment, uh, you've tried to establish your own righteousness, but it wasn't good enough, so I'm shutting the door. You're, you're left out. Uh, verse 23 in the KJV, But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed. Shut up. Okay, what does that mean? Our mouths are shut or we're in some kind of a prison? All right, let me see. 23 in the Amplified. It says, Now before faith came, we were kept in custody under the law, perpetually imprisoned in preparation for the faith that was destined to be revealed. Okay, verse 24 in the KJV. Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. Uh, so this is Paul's way of telling us that the, uh, the, the, the law serves the purpose of teaching us as, like a schoolmaster would teach you something, but the law is teaching us uh, you're a failure. Uh, here's um, 613 uh, laws, ordinances, rules, and regulations uh, given to Moses. Uh, all of them were written down, but 10 of them were written on stone by the finger of God. And uh, the 10 and all 613, all of those uh, follow them perfectly with not one mistake. Uh, otherwise, uh, you're, you're condemned. Uh, and if you recognize that it's impossible to follow them all, then you'll have learned your lesson. And the lesson is that you are a sinner. You are in a helpless, hopeless situation. There's no way for you to remedy the problem. There's no way to wash yourself clean. You need Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the only answer to the problem. The problem is sin and condemnation. 
the, the solution is Jesus paid for your sins and you will have eternal life if you put your faith completely in him. Don't have any faith in your own ability to please God. Uh, verse 25 of the Amplified. I'm anxious to see how they phrase that. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under the control and authority of a tutor or disciplinarian. Okay. Uh, 26 in the case JV. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Um, well, this is an opportunity to straighten out one of the biggest, um, um, probably almost universally held uh, error and heresy, uh, not only among Christians, but among all the religions of the world. And even the people who are not religious, even atheists, they like to say, well, we're all children of God, even if they don't believe in God. They think everybody is a child of God. But uh, we're taught in the scriptures that uh, we're children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. The only way to be a child of God is to put your faith in Jesus Christ. And when your faith is completely in Jesus, you're relying completely on him. You have no faith in your own righteousness. You have no faith in your ability to follow the laws and do good works so that God was uh, deems you acceptable. You have no faith in that. No faith in self. Your faith is entirely in Christ. Uh, once that happens, then the Holy Spirit of God enters you. That's the baptism of the Holy Spirit that happens at the moment of faith. And then the, the, the Holy Spirit continues living in you. That's the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And the Bible says that we are sealed with the Holy Spirit. So you're like a, can, a, a jar of preserves. And the jar is sealed tight and wax around it. And it's sealed. And the Holy Spirit is living in you. And uh, it says unto the day of redemption. So you don't need to worry that the Holy Spirit is going to leave you. Like it did with the Old Testament prophets. Like it did with the apostles before uh uh, before Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, and before Pentecost, when they had the uh, the Holy Spirit come. And before that, people would get um, filled with the Holy Spirit. The prophets were filled with the Holy Spirit. That means the Holy Spirit of God would enter them and empower them to do miracles. Uh, when Jesus breathed into the mouth of his apostles, before his death, burial, and resurrection, he, uh, he was filled them with the Holy Spirit in order to, to empower them to go and do miracles and preach. Uh, but that was temporary. They were not sealed with the Holy Spirit for eternity. Uh, the sealing of the Holy Spirit uh, only happened uh, for the very first time on Pentecost. And since then, every person who's put their faith completely in Jesus has had that same experience where they are baptized, indwelled, and sealed with the Holy Spirit. Um, let me see what verse am I on. Okay, so that, that's what makes a person a child of God. This is the point I should be making here. Uh, you're all children of God by faith in Christ. And, and until we put our faith in Christ and we get the Holy Spirit, and that's called regeneration, uh, we are quickened, our spirit is brought to life, my spirit, before I put my faith in Jesus, was like this stub and it's dead because I was born with a dead spirit. Adam and Eve sinned. Their spirit died that day. And every person born uh, as descendants of Adam and Eve have inherited in their genetic code a spirit that's a stub, a dead, dead spirit. Good for nothing. We have... A soul, which is our mind, our consciousness, our identity, our memories. We have uh, a body, which is the vehicle for the soul. And, and yet we have the spirit that is, is non-functional. Um, it's like, a, like an electrical outlet that's not plugged in. Uh, and it's, like, it's like a computer that's not logged on. There's no connection to the, to the Internet. Uh, so when we put our faith in Jesus... 
the Holy Spirit of God enters us, links to our dead spirit, brings our spirit to life, and stays attached to our spirit. Uh, we are in Christ, Christ is in us, and the Holy Spirit brought our spirit to life. Uh, the Bible uses the word quickeneth. That means to bring it to life. Uh, and then at that moment, we are identified, and, and this is irrevocable, it can never change, a child of God. But if you never have put your faith in Jesus, uh, you're not a child of God. Is that is that news to you? Most people think that, well, everybody's a child of God. No. Uh, the Bible actually says that we're all children of the devil until we get born again, and then we become a child of God. So if you don't want to remember, if you don't want to remain a child of the devil, then put your faith in Jesus and you'll be a child of God. You, some people I know are going to react horribly to that and say, oh, how could you say that we're all a child of the devil? That's what the Bible says. So uh, that uh, everybody is estranged from God. Uh, that's why we need reconciliation. Um, the, the sin that Adam and Eve passed down to us in our nature. And then as our, we live our lives, the sins that we've actively committed, that has created a barrier, an obstacle uh, between man and God, that we're estranged, a relationship couldn't exist. The temple uh, in Jerusalem, there was a, the outer area and the, the, uh, the, the curtain that separated the Holy of Holies where God dwelled. Um, you could not go beyond that curtain uh, because the curtain represented separation from uh, between us and God. Um, when Jesus died on the cross, the scripture says there was an earthquake and that the curtain in the temple was torn from top to bottom oh, and it completely opened up. And that's a picture of the sin barrier being removed. Uh, the thing that was preventing a relationship between you and God was torn down and no longer exists. Our sins and iniquities, he remembers no more. He's not holding our sins against us. So now we can all come to Jesus uh, and uh, Jesus will embrace us and save us. Uh, there's no reason uh, that you cannot put your faith in Jesus. Jesus desires you. This, this, we, God does not desire that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance, which means that we that hopefully everyone will change their mind, stop trying to get to heaven some other way, stop rejecting God or whatever it is. You need to change your mind and now have a new belief system. The belief is that God loves us so much that he came down from heaven. Uh, he became a man. God was manifest in the flesh. He lived among us as Jesus Christ, uh, God, man, and Savior. Uh, and uh, put your your new belief system is that you're believing in this person and you're trusting him to take you to heaven. You're drowning. He reaches and he pulls you out of this desperate hopeless situation. He pulls you out and he takes you to heaven. The only reason you're going to go to heaven is because Jesus is your Savior. And uh, that's what you need to believe. Believe. Um, so when it says God does not desire that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance, you need to repent. That means change your belief system and have this new belief system in that Jesus is your Savior God you are going to go to heaven only because Jesus promised it to you and you, and you have faith in him. In, in, uh, you believe he did pay for your sins and because of your faith in him, you will have eternal life. Um, verse 27. Well, let me read 26 in the Amplified. Let's see what that has to say. 26, for you who are born again have been reborn from above, spiritually transformed, renewed, sanctified, and are all children of God, set apart for his purpose with full rights and privileges through faith in Christ Jesus. Okay, well said, Amplified. Um, verse 27 of the KJV, 
For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. So um, have been baptized into Christ. That's not talking about water baptism. You should be very, very careful to not automatically believe that when you see the word baptize, baptism, baptized, um, that it's uh, referring to water. Most of the time, it's not referring to water. Um, unless the context leading up to it tells you that they're going to the lake or the river to get baptized, or that there's water mentioned, or there's some reason for you to believe that it's talking about water baptism, you shouldn't assume it's water baptism unless it's explicitly, uh, that's the conclusion you have to have. You should automatically assume it's spirit baptism. And the spirit baptism, as I said, happens to everyone who puts their faith in Jesus, that the Holy Spirit enters them. Uh, for as many of you as have been baptized into, into Christ, so the Bible says that we are in Christ, and it says Christ is in us. Um, now, how to describe that and explain it, uh, I'm not sure I can have a good way of explaining it, but uh, uh, there's, enough, there's enough there that you can just, you just accept the fact that Christ lives in you and you somehow are living in Christ. Let's see how this is stated in the Amplified 27. For all of you who were baptized into Christ, into a spiritual union with the Christ, the anointed, I have clothed yourselves with Christ. Uh, that is, you have taken on his characteristics and values. Uh, well, there I, I find fault in that. Uh, clothing yourself in Christ does not mean you have taken on his characteristics and values. Being uh, Putting on Christ means that, again, I'll go back to that example of uh, uh, the, the white robe of righteousness that we, I believe we read about in Revelation. And then the in the parable that talks about the wedding and uh, the people who have the wedding garments, the wedding garment is uh, is a white robe that the white does it signifying that your purity, there's no sin, uh, there's no blame, you're, you're faultless. God is, uh, deems you as righteous and set apart for heaven. And uh, that... Uh, that is putting putting on Christ means you're you're uh, you have His righteousness imputed to you, credited to you. You get credit for His righteousness. God looks at me and sees the righteousness of Jesus Christ on me. That's putting on Christ. Uh, verse twenty-eight in the KJV: There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. Um, so there's a lot. I could probably take this verse and do an hour on it, but I want to. I don't want to get too sidetracked, but I want to make a couple of points that I think are essential here. There is neither Jew nor, Jew nor Greek. So there is no different gospel that Paul had for the Gentiles compared to the one that James or Peter or John had for the Jews. The gospel is not different to the Jew or the, and, and the, uh, the Greek or the Gentile. It's the same gospel message. People who tell you otherwise are fools and liars. And um, it's easily proven. If you watch my uh, playlist, Paul Onlyism Debunked, I think uh, I do go very thorough job disproving, debunking all the claims of Paul Onlyus. Um, Paul Onlyus is the term that I use because basically the, these are people who believe that the only one we should be listening to regarding salvation is Paul. Um, uh, all the other books of the Bible, they're really not to us. They're for us so that we can learn some lesson but they don't apply to us in terms of learning how to get saved. Um, so that's what Paul-onlyism is. And uh, another word for that is 
hyper dispensationalism. The dispensationalism period is wrong, uh, but uh, hyper dispensationalism means that if my elbow can extend so that there's a 180 degree angle in my arm, but then I extend it even further, that's hyper. It means I, I've gone too far. It's, I've gone to an extreme. And something bad happens when you go to an extreme. The elbow will break. Uh, so uh, hyper dispensational means, wait, you've taken this idea of dispensationalism and you've gone way too far with it. Uh, you've, you've separated everything in the Bible and, and set Paul's letters aside as totally separate and uh, unique and, and uh, um, essential and none of the other books of the Bible, not even the book of John, uh, hyper-dispensationalists, they'll say, you can't get saved from reading John. And uh, every time I hear them teach such a thing, it just, it makes me sick to my stomach. And that's why I, probably more so than anybody you'll ever find on YouTube, uh, is arguing against these Paul Onlyists. Uh, so whether it's a Jew, or, or let's say it's a Jewish book, uh, like... Um, uh, Hebrews, uh, or whether or Matthew, Mark, uh, th these uh, and these um, gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, uh, the, the Paul Onlyists will say, well, these were written for, for the Jewish people, not for the Gentiles, and so you can't learn how to get saved from any of the gospel accounts. Uh, well, that that's that's a lie. Uh, uh, so, whether Jew or Greek, Jew or Gentile, uh, anybody can get saved by reading the Gospel account of John. And not just John, but many points in the Bible. There's even things in the Old Testament that tell us enough that uh, if we have faith in this uh, uh, blood sacrifice that would be offered to us. The difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament is basically that the Old Testament says uh, there will be someone coming in the future who will save the world. And uh, this person, uh, there will be a blood sacrifice to pay for sins, uh, the, the Lamb of God uh, who takes away the sin of the world. Uh, this person is coming in the future. Have faith in that they will come and provide this means of salvation for everyone. Uh, but the New Testament says that's all true and the time came, and he did. He did come uh, about two thousand years ago, and his name is Jesus Christ, Jesus of Nazareth, uh, the the great Savior God that was promised uh, and foretold in the Old Testament. So, um, so neither Jew nor Greek. There's there's one gospel message, and there's one congregation. There's one there's one uh, uh, body made up of Jews. And by the way, the, when it says Greek, um, they could very easily use the word Gentile. But, but Gentile just means that uh, it's not a Jew. Uh, let's say that the population of the world uh, that is Jewish in, in genealogy uh, is, let's say, it's 3% um, uh, of the world's population. So the remaining 97% are non-Jews, and these are Another word for the non-Jew is Gentile. So whether you're a Jew or a non-Jew, there is there is neither Jew or non-Jew. That's what it says. There is neither Jew or non-Jew. There is neither bond nor free. So whether a person is a free person or a bond servant or whatever, there's no distinction in terms of how they get saved and their their identity as a child of God and a member of the body of Christ. There is neither male nor female. Uh, there should be no distinction. A, a male should not be elevated in any way above a female believer. Uh, and there is neither, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. We're all equal, equally saved, equally valued by God. Let me read that in the Amplified. There is now no distinction in regard to salvation, neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. 
For you who believe are all one in Christ Jesus, no one can claim a spiritual superiority. Okay. That was well done by the Amplified. And I like the fact that it says, there is now no distinction in regard to salvation. So, uh, Jew or Greek, male or female, bond or free, it doesn't matter. Salvation is the same for, for, for all of us. So, the people who tell you that, no, there's the gospel of the grace of God from Paul, from Paul and then there's the gospel of the kingdom that's to all the Jews. It's a different gospel, different means of salvation. Uh, I just... Yeah, man, I, that, that lie really, really makes me angry. I'm just totally fed up with that lie. Okay, trying to control my, my temper here. Uh, verse 29 in the KJV. And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So, yeah. So if we are Christ, then we are in Christ. Christ is the seed that was uh, uh, foretold uh, to Abraham, that the world may be blessed from Abraham's seed, singular. Paul made a big deal tell, telling us that this is not plural, but it's singular. So it's talking about an individual. The individual is Christ. And since you are in Christ, then you're an heir of, of that promise made to Abraham. And the Amplified says, says, verse 29, And if you belong to Christ, if you are in him, then you are Abraham's descendants and spiritual heirs according to God's promise. Okay. All right, so that's the end of chapter 3. Um, I, I hope that helped you. And uh, if you have not seen this series from the beginning, I hope you will go back and watch it, especially watch the introductory video. Most of my introductory videos are you know, around five minutes long. The introductory video for this series is almost an hour, but I believe that it's very, very important you watch the introductory video because it lays the foundation so that you can understand the rest of the, the teaching of the book of Galatians. So if you just found this video, please take the time to go back and watch this whole series from the beginning. Thank you for watching, and bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus.